So at least procedurally, when you see this, it means plug this in for x. Plug it in for x. It happens. 2 times negative 2 cubed plus 3 times negative 2 squared minus 5 times negative 2 plus 2. Okay. Let's see, we get uh, negative 8, right? Times 2, negative 16. Uh, 4 times 3, that's 12. Plus 10, plus 2. function is worth at negative 2. So if this means plug negative 2 in for x, what does this mean? Plug your x plus h in. There, very good. This is the first hurdle, all right? So we want to make sure that we uh, go over this hurdle. So 2 times x cubed plus 3 times x squared, that's x plus h, <coughs> minus 5 times x, which is x plus h now, Uh, if you thought it was simple, you realized it wasn't after you plugged it in. Because what does it mean to cube this? Multiply h plus h times x plus h times x plus h times x plus h, x plus h again plus 3 times x plus h times x plus h minus 5x minus 5h. Plus oh. This is 3 times x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. Expanding binomials. Have you heard this is the binomial theorem? Yes. Yeah. Well, foil. Binomial theorem is a way to expand a binomial for any power. 10, 12, or 13. Okay. First let's start with we know this is gonna happen, right? We know we're gonna get an x to the to the third. And we know at the very end we're gonna get an h to the but you know, in between, we're going to get plus x squared times h. And we're going to get x times h squared. And then we'll have h to the third, right? That's, gonna have, that's all the possible combinations. All right? What about xh? Uh, that isn't going to happen. Oh. Because uh, the only time we get xh is like this first parentheses, x times h. But then that's going to get multiplied by stuff in this parentheses, right? So an x. So one thing, I mean, that's a good question. One thing that we should realize is that the sum of the exponents will always be three. Okay. So now just we denote the coefficients. Finding coefficients is easy. Here's the coefficients for uh, for the powers two, one, two, one. Right. I'm sure we had to find the other ones really easily. Do you recognize this triangle? How do you think I get this two? You added yeah, I added this one and this one to get a two. So what do you think this is gonna be? One, three, three again, one. How about this one? One, four, four, one, hold it, hold your horses. One, one, five, ten, ten, five, one, and However many layers you want to go, it's called Pascal's Triangle. It's useful for many things. We can find the Fibonacci sequence in here. Uh, but the thing that we want uh, to utilize is a uh, binomial theorem because these guys here. Uh, look at this, one, two, one. Those are the coefficients for when you square. Right? So this is the zeroth row. This is the first row. This is the, see if we raise it to the first power, the coefficients are one and one. Uh, this guy is for the third power. So the coefficients that we're looking for are 1, 3, 3, and 1. If you do it out long ways, which you probably did, which I commend you for, uh, hopefully that's what you did. If I take it to the fourth power, easy. Just go to this row. 
x to the fourth plus four times x cubed h plus six times x squared h squared plus four x h cubed plus h to the fourth. Okay. So we distribute the two, two x cubed plus six x squared h plus six x h squared plus two h cubed plus three x squared plus six x h plus three h squared minus five x minus five h squared plus two. Okay, we look for common terms, like terms. See any like terms? No, you're not going to, because this one, as we talked about before, the, the sum of these exponents is always going to be three. The sum of these exponents is always going to be two. So the these is always going to be 1, if you realize that, you know, there's not going to be any like terms anywhere in here. So that's it. That's what it is. So as we Why? go into finding derivatives and slopes and tangent lines and all that kind of stuff, uh, that's the first hurdle is plugging in x plus h for a bunch of x's, and this, particularly if we cube that. Thing. You think you can do it? Right? Trouble with that? Good on that. Especially when you have this guy here disposable. Remember, this is the zeroth row. First, second, third row. You can always tell the number of the row by this first number that's not one. Until the baby is here. So this is a, a basic thing, and now we're going to talk about what we started talking about the first day, which is slopes of tangent lines. Okay? We're talking about limits, you've got to have limits to be able to first get into the very definition of what the derivative is, what the slope of tangent lines. So we're going to review. Let's review. We've got a function, and let's take a look at its graph. Let's say it looks like that. Right? Zoning off the girl. That's your superhero name. Uh, and the question here is what? About that. There. How to what? Find the slope. Find what? The slope. the slope, yeah. That line there, what's the slope? How do we find the slope? Right? Like, anybody feel like they can explain how it is that we did like that first second day? Yeah. I think so. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just so that it is I don't know, not muddled at all and it's straightforward. At some value of x, we want to find the slope of the tangent line. The, 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 the slope of the line that is tangent at that point. How many tangent lines do you think are at that point? One. Just one. Only possible to get one. If you want to imagine what a, a tangent line is, um, imagine like a, a solid curve. I'll use my hand. It's not the best curve, but solid curve. Yes? Can we have the homework? Because we want to try a couple of examples before we watch the examples to see if we can do it. Uh, yes. It should be going down in about five minutes. Okay. okay. We'll wait five minutes. And if it doesn't, I'll ask you. All right. So you imagine a, a solid curve, not like these uh, these graphs. They're not solid. They're definitely you can move through them. And it doesn't stop us from moving. Maybe I'll use it on a piece of paper like this. Okay. I want to talk about the tangent uh, line at a point. Well, first I have to pick a point, like right there. Tangent line is a line that goes just through that one point okay, on the graph. Right? So that would be like something straight right, and rigid coming along. And you can only touch it at that one point in one way at one slope. 
If I move it this way and I get a different slope, well, I've rolled onto a different point. If I roll it this way, I've rolled on top of another point. Okay, got it. One tangent line at any point. Well, the only way that we really know to find a slope is two minus one, one over two minus x one, which implies there's two, x is two y's, two points. So we pick another point, this guy over here. We draw, what kind of line is this? Seek. Yes, yeah, seek it. Look at that line. And how does the slope of that seek it line compare to the tangent line? Touch is two points less steep. Touch is two points. It's, it's not as steep, or is it not the same, but it's just it's kind of close, right? Kind of close. Closer than, well, than it could be. It could be farther off. It could be worse. How could it be better? Two points are closer. Two points are closer. Let's cut it down in half. How could it be better than that? Closer, closer, closer. closer. So we, let's just leave this as our picture. We pick some other point, right? We could uh, just for a moment call it x2. This could be called x1. And then this could be y1, this could be y2. We just want to give them different names. Instead of y, we'll, we'll say specifically this is dy at x. This is the, the output of the function at x. This guy here is f of, for just a moment, x2, right? Sure. But instead of calling it x and x2, what we really want to have happen is uh, it's a little bit easier to think of that space between the two points getting small rather than the two points becoming the same, you know, x being the same value. So we'll just call this guy delta x, or later h. So x2 is actually where? x plus h, x plus delta x. So this would be the y at x plus h, or x plus delta x. y1 over x2 minus x1. What happens here in the denominator? x minus x is 0. f of x plus h minus f of x over h. OK, right now, what does this, exactly this, tell us? Well, right now, we're getting there, but right now it tells us <coughs> slope between two points. We're going to move those points closer together, and when they get right on top of each other, we'll have an instantaneous rate of change. So now that we've had all this experience with limits, in terms of the limits, what do we want to do with this? The limit as what approaches zero? As x approaches zero. So x approaches zero? No, as h approaches zero. H approaches zero, because h is the distance between the two points. Yeah. And we want to we zero out that distance. So you can see with all the different kinds of f of x's that we could wind up with, we want to have a, a good background of limits. We know those value limits. There's all these limits that we make with this this difference quotient, they could look very different from each other. We want to be able to do, manipulate several different kinds of functions in their limits. Um, um, we'll come back to that in a second. Let me just take a quick time out and help you with something that a few are struggling with, and so 
So this hand, your hand, your left hand, represents the first quadrant of the unicircle. Right? So way back here, right there, that's zero, zero. Out here is zero. This guy would be pi over six. This guy would be pi over four. Five over three. And if you hold your thumb a little more up like this, just change it to the set of thunder like that. Five two. <laughs> We're all good on that? Now, this what I'm about to show you is just a coincidence. It's not really math behind it, it just works out nicely to our advantage, so it's easy to remember the sines and cosines of each of these angles. Uh, it's a very useful thing. And then when it comes to remembering sines and cosines of the rest of the angles, it's just the mirror image in some way of the first quadrant. So that's all we really have to know. Uh, so we're going to start here. We're going to call this the We're going to call this like the zeroth angle, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the, of the ones that we're interested in. Calling it zero, one, two, three, four makes this next little trick nice. So if we go this way, counting zero, one, two, three, four in that direction, then we can remember the signs really easily. Okay? So it's always the square root of, let's say, the angle number. 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, or 2. You notice these are all, or could be written as over 2. 1 half over 2, that's not 1 half over 2, but 1 half. Something over 2, something over 2, something over 2. And then you got your, well, you could write the other one as over 2, which we'll see in just a second. So it's the square root of the, the angle number over 2 for the sine. The square root of the 0 at the angle, square root of 0 over 2. What's the square root of 0? Divided by two, zero, sine is zero. This is the first angle, square root of one over two, what's the square root of one? One. Oh, one half. Well, it's this, this is the second angle, what's the square root of two? Well, it's the square root of two. Square root of two over two, okay? Here is the third angle, square root of three over two. Here's the fourth angle, square root of four over two, what's the square root of four? What's two over two? You want to remember the signs? Go that way. And you think about the, the sign, when you think about the unit circle, the sign is the vertical, right? The vertical part of that angle, where that angle is. And cosine is horizontal, sine is vertical. So if we want to remember the, that this way is sine, well, obviously they're going to get bigger. They're going to go from 0 to 1 half to square root of 2 over 2. Square root of 2 is bigger than 1. So square root of 2 over 2 is bigger than 1 half. Square root of 3 is bigger than square root of 2, so that's bigger than that. And then, of course, 1 is bigger than square root of 2 over 2 is bigger than square root of 3 over 2. We'll go to the next page, and I paste this in. Wow. Going this direction, thinking of this is the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 angle. Then we remember the cosine of the exact same. Square root of 0 over 2, square root of 1 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 3 over 2, square root of 4 over 2. Those are the cosines. Okay, so if you forget for some reason, then you can pick up the hand, one, two, three, square to three over two, that's the sign of the way around that way. Because okay. um, the time is here for us to know our trick values, because you're gonna ex be expected to know those ones. So you're, you're gonna be expected to know the, the sign of negative five, five, or six. You're gonna be expected to know that, or be ready to know that on 
So if a 0.86 on the test you know, that I gave back, all right. But it's time to remember the exact values. So let's get on that train, I guess. All right, back to regular life. We're talking about the difference quotient. This guy right here, slope between two points. Just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 written in a ridiculously complicated uh, fashion. And we take the limit as it approaches zero. If we can let h go to zero, what is h? h is the distance between, the horizontal distance between the points. If we let that go to zero, the points will be the same point. Okay? It can't ever really happen, right? Like this function here has a hole in it. So we kind of take that hole out and we figure out what it's getting close to. And what it's getting close to is obviously the slope of the line, right? That's what we're looking for. All right. So let's take the original example that I just had at the beginning of class. So we are going to take this guy here, and we want to know what is the slope of the tangent line at x equals negative 2. It's really a matter of just knowing all of these pieces. up here to this picture. Now this isn't exactly a picture of what we're doing because I'm, this is not the function that I read. This isn't even negative 2. The point is we have the function, x cubed, 2x cubed, something, something, something. And we want to know the slope of the tangent line at some x. And in this case, the x is negative 2. So we can start off by replacing all the x's with negative 2's. Do all of, oh, do all of this work with negative 2 right there. Negative 2 right there. So we want to find f of x is f of negative 2. We found that is h. If we want to find f of negative 2 plus h, and we can go 2 times negative 2 plus h cubed plus 3 times negative 2 plus h squared minus 5 times negative 2 plus h plus 2. It's 2 times. Uh, well, this triangle still works. It's just that we don't have an x anymore. We have a negative 2 that's going to take the place of all the x's. But still, 1, 2, 1, 1, 3, 3, 1. 1, 3, 3, and 1. Well, we still have h. We're still going to have h cubed. We get an h squared here. h to the first. No h is there. It's just the thing that is cubed is negative 2. Cubed, negative 2. Squared, negative 2. First. That's how all that turns to be. And then we have. Three times negative two squared plus two times negative two h plus uh, h squared minus. We're getting crowded. Let's get rid of this. We've got no use out of that. Minus five. No. Sorry. Plus ten minus five h plus two. Going here, two, 
times negative 8 plus 12, uh, 8, let's see, uh, h plus 12h uh, minus 6h squared plus h to the third plus, uh, let's see, 3 times 4, that's 12, 3 times negative 4h, right, minus 12h, 3 times h squared, 3h squared, plus 10, minus 5h, plus 2. Uh, following along, so we're okay? No more big deal or anything? Maybe you made some mistakes, but you see what's going on. 2 times negative 8, negative 16, 24h, 12h squared, 2h cubed, it's 12. Now we're gonna have some like terms because we've gotten rid of the x's, right? The x's were replaced with negative twos. So uh, let's see, we'll start with the h's to the highest power, let's say that. h cubed, two h cubed. Uh, so that's uh, h squared, so there's one, there's one. So three h squared minus 12 h squared, nine h squared, that and that have been combined. H, 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 24, 12, uh, 7, H, right? 6, H? I got 24 minus 12 is 12, minus 5, yeah, 7. Okay, that one, and that one, and that one, and now we just have the constants left. Thanks. What'd you get? Eight. Eight. <coughs> okay. What's this? After all that work, what is that? Oh my goodness. What? So, no, not a slope. You would think that we have something to show for all that work. What is it? It's just f of negative 2 plus h. That's all it is. But what's left is, is far less complicated. We've done all that work, and what have we found? We found this part of it. <laughs> okay? That's okay. So now we've got f of negative 2 plus h. We've got f of negative 2. h is just always h. So we just plug it in. out down here because it's not going to take much more space. <laughs> yes, because 8 is f of negative 2. So 2h cubed minus 9h squared plus 7h plus 8 minus, okay, that's f of negative 2 plus h, f of x plus h. And now f of negative 2, we subtract, is 8. h, we want to find the limit of this as, it, as h goes to 0. Okay, what do you notice in the numerator? Your 8 and minus 8 are going to cancel out. Not surprising. Because all of these constants that we put together, those are just the numbers we got when we plugged in negative 2 for x and no h is got. And we can, yes, we can factor out an h from all of these. Okay, so this is the limit as as h approaches 0 of h times 2h squared minus 9h plus 7 over h. Our experience with limits doesn't surprise us when we cancel out this h, right? Because if we back up one step, and we want to know the limit of this as h approaches 0, what would be the best case scenario for finding that limit? Yeah, you plug it in. Direct substitution. Uh, and don't get a zero in the denominator, but we do. But we also get a zero in the numerator, so we know that this limit is findable. It's not going to infinity or something. So we can plug zero in there and there, that's not working out. But then, of course, we made it easy on ourselves to figure out that h can cancel. Just like that. <laughs> and we're left with what's the limit as h approaches zero of, of this new function that agrees at all but one point. 
What are we getting when plugging zeros? Seven. Number seven. That's it. Write all that work to find the number seven. What's the significance of that number seven? That's the limit. It's the limit of the function. Okay, it's the limit of this function. And what is the limit as h goes to zero of this function that we constructed? Tell us. The slope. The slope. This guy, slope of the line tangent to the point of this graph at x equals negative 2. We looked at that graph, we went over to x is negative 2, and we looked at the slope of the tangent line, the slope would be 7. 7 over 1. Let's take a look. Let's turn that out. Right, so we got 2x cubed plus 3x cubed. Minus 5x plus 2. So right there, right there at that very point, go to negative 2, the y value is 8. Right? And if we were to draw the line as tangent, we can quite be right because this uh, screen is, is not uh, the scale of the x and y axis are different. But the slope would come out to be 7 over 1. It goes up 7 for every 1 that it goes over. Okay. Well, I know it was a lot of work, but it's a pretty amazing thing that we were able to do. Okay. Effectively, we have done no calculus here, except for maybe the idea of limits. Okay. But using just really strong algebra skills and uh, a really inspired way of trying to find the slope of this tangent line by letting two points get closer to each other, uh, we were able to find exactly what the slope of that tangent line would be. It's pretty amazing. Um, why don't we... I'm going to have you find one for an easier function. f of x equal negative 3x plus 2. That makes it so much easier. Okay. Uh, so we want to find the slope of the line tangent to the point on that graph at x equals 4. So we need f of 4 for one thing. We need f of 4 plus h. Well, f of 4 is going to be negative 10, right? And uh, 4 plus h, take that out, 4 plus h plus 2. Negative 12 minus 3h plus 2. There's that. Okay. So what we're really working on here is f of 4 plus h minus f of 4 over h. We're going to let the whole thing, we're going to let h go. So we have negative 12 minus 3h plus 2 minus negative 10 over h. Now let's see, negative 12 plus 2 is negative 10 minus negative 10 plus 10 is 0. Just a hint, or you know, there's a tip. If your number parts don't completely cancel each other out, you did something wrong with them. If we had gone uh, in this previous one and we didn't get 8 minus 8, <coughs> we did something wrong. Okay, just a clue, like a check. Right? Well, this is obviously much simpler. H can't go to 0 yet. If we did put 0 in for H, we get 0 for 0. But I mean, H's can cancel each other out when we're talking about the limit. Uh, so it equals. The limit as h goes to 0 of negative 3. What do I do about that? What's the limit of negative 3 as h goes to 0? h doesn't affect it. It's always negative 3. So, what does this mean? That's the slope of the slope of the tangent line to this graph at x equals 4. Now, who knew this before you even started? 
Right. This is what? Line. It's a line. Every point will have a tangent line that has a slope of negative 3. Okay. I like stuff like this because if we weren't so tied up in this f of x plus h and stuff, you probably just know that already. Uh, but you get so tied up in what you're doing. I, I remember in chemistry class one time, we were given this sheet of, of uh, chemical compounds and we're supposed to name them all. This is the nomenclature of chemistry. And came upon this one. How do you name that one? Water. It's water. It has a name. Dihydrogen monoxide, you know, everybody was so focused on naming them correctly that everybody put dihydrogen. I think it was a little joke that kind of the teacher put in there. It's water. It has a name already. It's named. It's water. <laughs> anyway, we're kind of doing that with this. Any point, any point on this graph is going to have a tangent line with slope of x. Um, let's, we could even, um, we could even prove that, okay? Let's say you didn't even realize this was a line. Rather than plugging in a specific x, like 4, 5, or 7, I mean, can we repeat this process for 4, and 5, and 7, and so on? Sure we can. In fact, let's do it a better one than this, because this is too easy. Let's do a, but pretty simple. f of x equals x squared plus, uh, we'll just do x squared plus all of that. And then probably take you a couple minutes. I think you'll be done pretty soon. So go ahead and at, at x equals uh, f of 4 plus h, f of 4, and I've just plugged it into our difference quotient, the limit, as h goes to 0. So 19 minus 19 should happen, right? The only things left in the numerator should have h in them, so cancel the h in the denominator, that's the whole idea here. Okay, limit as h goes to 0 of h, that's 8h plus nothing over h. Okay, cancel h's limit as h goes to 0 of h plus h. Now we can plug in h because we don't get it as 0 in the denominator, and now what, is, what does that give us? Before we started, I put a little piece of paper up here. I've written on something on there. Okay. Before I even did the work. faster way to do this, but it doesn't really, yeah. to not understand this would be cheating ourselves, at least for the AP test. If you don't really get this, you don't recognize this cosine of, um, of let me think about this for a second. like a pi over 2 plus h over h, the limit as h goes to 0. You might think this is a limit problem. Oh, let me find the limit. Let me try and cancel out the h in the denominator. This is getting hard. Okay. But if you keep in mind, stuff like h and delta x in it are really about the derivative, then we realize this is just It's just the, the limit, or not the limit, but the the uh, slope of tangent line uh, of cosine of x, f of x equals the cosine of x at where? At pi over 2. Now, of course, you don't have any way of figuring that out. To do with cosine, right? We just used both polynomials so far. So, but if you recognize it as, oh, this is just the slope of the tangent line of this, there's something called the derivative, and we're going to find the derivative of cosine will tell us this. Uh, but you need to, 
You need to have the basics. You gotta have the foundation. Okay, so let's come back to this one. So I did it for x equals four. Can I do it for x equals five? Mm -hmm. X equals seven. Negative 12. Yes, anything. Any x. I just replace this four with whatever and this four with whatever. Okay. How would that go? Just plug it in there and we do all the workout and we do this and this and this and this and this and we have a number one reduced. Right? Well, what if we did this instead? Instead of doing all the work with a four plugged in or a seven plugged in or whatever, we can say forget about four. Because really, like I'm erasing all these fours, right? Isn't this going to be the exact same? Like even plus three is going to be the same. It's going to look almost exactly the same for any value I plug in, right? I'm going to square it here, and I'm going to get you know, something. I'm going to put it there, and I'm going to square it. I'm going to get that thing squared, and two times that thing times h. And then I'm going to add three, and then you know it's just going to be the exact same process, just different numbers. Okay. So instead of at x equals four, let's, uh, let's go ahead. This, this, this. How about at x equals x equals x, right? Let x take on any value. I basically, don't plug in a number. Just leave it x. Well, whatever number we plug in, it's going to get squared, right? So we're going to get x squared plus 3. So the f of x part, the minus f of x part, just becomes minus the whole function, with x still in there. Like, no number gets squared. We just say, well, whatever number it is, we'll get squared. We'll put x there. We'll get x squared plus 2 times x times h plus 2 squared plus 3. Okay. And nothing's really going to get simplified there, so we don't really have a last step that one. But then f of x plus h just becomes f of x plus h with x in it instead of 4. x plus 2x h plus h squared minus x squared plus 3 over h. Now what's going to happen? Uh, oh, squared. I don't know what that one is. x squared. This x squared minus x squared? Goodbye. Oh, plus 3, plus 3, so h squared plus 3. 3 minus 3, by what's left? Factors of h in them. 2, let's say h times 2x plus h squared. Just h, not squared, just h. You're right. All over h, we're taking the limit as h goes to 0. And the h's cancel, and we let h go to 0, and what are we left with? 2x. Let's test it for x equals 4. What was the slope at 4? What would we get before there? All the work got done for all values of x. And now what we have is a new function. Right? We can plug anything in here for x. And when we plug anything we want in there for x, we'll know what? the slope of the tangent line at that point. That, is that not amazing? I mean, we have a new function. Like it's a magic computer that will calculate very easily the slope of the tangent line at any x. If you're not thrilled right now, you're just, I don't know, you're having a bad day, or <laughs> you don't love math, OK? This little guy right here is a magic computer that will tell you, for this function, the slope of not between any two points, but at exactly at this point, at any point you choose. And all I need to know, I don't even need to know y anymore, I just need to know what x is. Just plug an x, it's all done. So like at any point along the entire line, you can find the slope. Anywhere, a thousand, a negative one million, like it's going to tell you the slope anywhere. If I, if I said a few minutes ago, find the slope at x equals seven, you know, seven, seven plus h, seven squared, plus 14h, plus h squared, plus three, and plug that in, you get all that, you get all, and you get done, what would you find? 14. All the work. Basically, you did the hard work of leaving x in there. But then at the end, what you have is something much more useful, much faster for finding the slope. Okay? It's this new function. And we call this function the derivative. Okay? 
the derivative, this magic computer function, that tells you the slope at any point. Okay, let me move this over. We call it the derivative and we also give it this notation. Right? It's, it's a nice notation because it's in reference to f. Right? It is the derivative of f. And we know it's the derivative of f because it has a little uh, apostrophe in there. And we call it f prime of x. f prime of x. Really, we call it f prime. f prime, f prime of x. f prime means the derivative. And the derivative, what is the derivative? Of that Yeah. The derivative isn't just a slope. The derivative is, is this thing. What is this thing? It's a function, right? It's a whole it's a whole function that will tell you the slope at any point if you give it x. Okay? And we can do this with uh, any function. Okay? It's within reason because we need to uh, be able to do this stuff here, cancel things out and cancel out h's. That would be difficult to do with, say, like cosine of x plus h. I don't know, that doesn't really work as well as it does with polynomials. Okay? So, there you go. And if it were, if it were, you know what, if, it, if we went all the way back to that guy right there, actually that work was done in the previous slide. The work was done way back here. Um, look at this right here, what's this? Yes. How did we find it? Where did it come from? Just f of x plus h. It's just this. It's just the f of x plus h part of it. Here, let's use this. Let's put this to work. Delete some of that stuff. Yes, we can find the derivative of that. We need this for it. Right? Where, is, where are my handles? There they are. Best place possible. Say this was uh, f, of x plus h. f of x plus h. Right? What was, what was the f, by the way? f of x was two oh, x cubed plus three x squared minus five x plus two x plus two. If we plug f, of, or if we plug x plus h in there, we'll get this. If we simplify it, okay. Well, that's the x plus h part. We'll just leave that. I don't want to write that again. That's silly. Uh, minus what? That. Okay, minus that. Uh, let's rotate it a bit. Put it right there. Yes. Okay, we'll just put parentheses around there. All over? H. But the nice thing happens, what happens now? 2x cubed with 2x cubed. 3x squared with 3x squared. Negative 5x, negative 5x. 2, 2. You got h times 6x squared. 6x plus 2h squared plus 6x plus 3h minus 5. All over h. h is canceled because we're looking at the limit of h approaches 0. Got to be Plug in 0 for h, what do we get? 6x squared. 6x squared. Plus 6x. Plus 6x. Plus 2. Plus 2. Plus 6x. Wait, no, not no. plus 2, not plus 2. Or plus 6, so anything that, does, that, yeah. that basically has an h and it goes away, yeah. that guy, plus 6x, minus 5. That's the derivative of that. That is f prime. That's the derivative of this function right here, right? And what does this function do? It finds the tangent slope. It finds the slope of any tangent line at any point at any x. That's pretty freaking amazing. Like we got f of x is 2x cubed plus 3x squared minus 5x plus 2. And we get this super simple function here. 
that will just give it an x <coughs> and do some very simple complication or uh, computation, and you have the slope of the tangent line at any x. Amazing. Okay, I'm just gonna yeah. Wow. So um, now, if we understand that f prime, the derivatives, right, tells us what? The slope of the tangent line. Okay. Let's talk about this guy. What, what kind of slope do we have here? What kind of slope? What kind of slope do we have here? And here. And over here. And here. And here. And here. Zero slope. Right? Horizontal? Zero slope. Yes. Okay. So we've got a little bit of time. We're going to do a little group activity. Okay. Each of you are going to get one of these. Uh, but I want, yeah, I want you to all fill it out. Just work together. Okay, I've got groups. How do I want to group you guys? Let's see. Group of three over here. You buy case eta. Four right here. You group of four. And you group of three back there. Yeah? Okay. So get into those groups. Uh, group your chairs or grab a table back there if you want. Right here. I have my copy of the worksheet up here. Hopefully we've all noticed this. That here and here and here and here and here we have what? Zero slopes. Okay, so the derivative is a function that if you plug in x it tells us the value of the slope. That's kind of a long thing to say, but it's a really important thing to say. It's a function that we can plug any x into and it gives us out the y and the y importantly is the slope of the graph. Okay, so I'm going to draw my f prime function with this blue color. Right? So I'm going to make a blue dot at this x value right here. Right? So I've, I've, I've consulted my derivative by f prime, and I've asked my f prime, k f prime, what is the value of the slope at this point right here? What did it tell me? I put a negative, you know, negative 7, negative, I don't know what this x value is, it's not specific, but I know I got out. Zero, right? The y value of the derivative is the slope. So the y value of the derivative should be on the x-axis. Right? The dot should be on the x-axis. Same for this one. I asked it, what is the derivative at this point? Zero. So I should not, it shouldn't be positive, it shouldn't be negative, it should be zero. Okay? The, the mistake that we make is trying to get the slopes of the derivative to match the slopes. The slope of the derivative has nothing to do with what the slope of the original function is. It's the y value y value of the derivative tells what the slope is. Okay, so we have zeros wherever we have horizontal tangent lines. All right? Now, what kind of slope is this? A negative slope. In between these two, we should see these same kinds of slopes, right? Because imagine you went, you're at zero, just like we are here, and then you cross over into the negatives. Right? How are you going to get back to the positives? You got to cross zero again, right? So in between two zeros, there's no way to go positive without. Well, you have to cross a zero, and, and there is no zero in between two zeros. At least two zeros are right next to each other. So this is a negative slope, but it's it's not all that big. Well, this is steeper, but it's still negative. So it's still like the magnitude is bigger. It's further from the x-axis. But you know, we're going to come back, and we're going to have a, a zero slope. And these are really shallow, like close to zero, but still negative slopes. So we start to see these values, we follow all these points, and we realize we got some kind of a shape like that. What kind of slopes are these over here? Positive, Positive slopes, right? So the y value of the derivative should match the slope of the original function. Well, that's positive. Positive slopes, big, big positive slopes out here, I bet, right? So the derivative also is going to Okay, what kind of slopes are these here? Positive, 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 big positive, and then coming back down to zero. All right, so why don't we finish this up, uh, finish up just drawing the graphs, and the uh, book work is coming out as well. Put the desks back, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my